Before coming to UUCCI, I lived in the Detroit area and attended a large church called Renaissance Unity. We had a professional gospel choir and band performing every Sunday for an extremely diverse congregation numbering in the thousands. The music there was powerful, uplifting, and Motown inspired. It was one of the main reasons that kept me and many others coming back, regardless of what else was happening with ministers, congregational politics, etc. Before I left Renaissance Unity, however, I did begin to feel a bit torn about the gospel music that had filled me with so much joy and passion. I struggled with the lyrics that personified God as a he or him. I didn't agree with many of the Jesus Savior sayings used in those songs, but the emotion of the music can still move me like nothing else. Although UUCCI is vastly different from the church that I left, I do appreciate the language more. I appreciate the more humanistic view of religion. I appreciate the nature-centered poetry, the deeper focus on social justice, the environmental concerns, and in a different way, I appreciate the music. Probably my favorite UU song is Blue Boat Home. I first recognized the melody as Alleluia, Sing to Jesus, a song I learned at my childhood Catholic church. Apparently, the Welsh hymn composed by Roland Pritchard has been used for several songs throughout the years. But I like Peter Mayer's lyrics best. I believe one of the lines, drifting here with my ship's companions, all we kindred pilgrim souls, speaks to our theme today of being welcoming and widening our circle. It reminds me of the saying that we are all in the same boat. We have common goals as human beings. We are on this journey together. Personally, I like this current little UUCCI boat that I'm on, but I also know there's room for others and I can welcome them aboard. So ahoy mateys, now let's have our chalice lighting. Today, I have the honor of getting to share this fabulous book with you. It is called Intersection Allies, We Make Room for All. And it's written by Chelsea Johnson, Latoya Council, and Carolyn Choi. It's illustrated by Ashley Seal Smith, and the foreword is by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. It is through the permission of the creators of this book and through Dodor Press that we are able to share this story with you today. I am grateful to them. You can pick up a copy at dodopress.com or at your local bookstore. And with a little help from my friends, shall we listen to the story today? Witness the lives of a bold group of friends. If one is in need, another defends. Age is one trait that each of them share, but kids' lives are unique, as you'll soon be aware. Each child has a story and their own point of view, filled with passion and power, just like you. My name is Alejandra, but I go by Allie. I use a chair, but it doesn't define me. Instead, it allows me to zip, glide, and play. When I need to get through, my friends help make a way. Where there is room for some, we make room for all. Friends can be allies, no matter how small. Hello, I'm Parker. After school every day, Allie's family takes care of us both while we play. My mom works hard to provide for me, for love's the source of our stability. No toys or money, nor treasures untold. Community care is more precious than gold. Skirts and frills are cute, I suppose, 
but my superhero cape is more cape than those bows. Some may be confused that a kid like me can wear what I want and be proud and carefree. My friends defend my choices and place. A bathroom, like all rooms, should be a safe space. My name is Adila, and just like Kate, what I wear inspires endless debate. Some give, some chant, some thing, some pray. My hijab is my choice. You can choose your own way. The clothes that you wear never justify hatred. Clothes can be playful, simple, or sacred. Covered, adorned, or with casual flair. My body's my own. I dress it with care. My name is Nia, and with what's on the news, it's easy to be frightened or sing the blues for her, for them, for him, for me. We all deserve to breathe and be free. The color of our skin is no reason to hide. We protest for safety, equality, and pride. Our friends join along in solidarity and love. This is the stuff that allies are made of. Safety also includes our trees and air, the land we've called home, our places of prayer. I am Dakota, and like my ancestors, my tribe and I are water protectors. From profit and power, we stand up to preserve our nations, our cultures, and the respect we deserve. My name is Gloria, y tengo siete años. After school, it's to the fruteria I go. Trabajo cada día junto a mi madre. Vendemos piña dulce y mangos con chile. My language and savvy allow us to thrive. I've got hopes and dreams and skills and drive. Working together makes us both more secure. I'm a daughter, a partner, and an entrepreneur. My name is Hijong and I was born in Seoul. I moved here when I was five years old. I'm part of what's called the 1.5 generation. My parents and I span two different nations. Like Gloria, I am a help to my mother by translating for her one word to another. When the landlord tells mom, you can pay me next Friday, I repeat in Korean, we navigate life in our new home together because kids have the skills to make every day better. My name is Yuri, and I'm new to this place. Hijong's family welcomed me with love and with grace. Finding refuge meant traveling far from home. I sailed. I flew. I rode, I roamed, escaping violence, war, heartache, and intrusion. We came to this nation seeking dreams and inclusion. From near, from far, from here, from there. We're more than our origins. We all deserve care. Race, religion, citizenship, class, and ability. Each of these intersects to form identity. Age, gender, size, and skin color too can make living life different for a friend than for you. Barriers and biases are often to blame. We strive to be equal, but not all the same. Life's ups and downs can take many forms but standing together will rewrite the norms. Where there's room for some, we make room for all. Friends can be allies. No matter how small. The work of Columbus Interfaith remains focused on its purpose as outlined in Article 2, Section 2 of the organization's Articles of Incorporation, which read, one, providing a sanctuary for self-discovery, spiritual renewal, 
and worship, education, and the practice of each other's faiths, core values, and traditions. Two, honoring the need of its member organizations to be separate but interdependent. Three, finding common ground in working together. Four, exploring opportunities for shared spaces. Five, devising appropriate oversight and governance of common areas and shared space. And finally, six, working together to develop a master plan. I've been considering the phrase, all my relations for some time now. It's hugely important. It's our saving grace in the end. It points to the truth that we are all related that we are all connected, that we all belong to each other. The most important word is all, not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me, speak like me, pray like me, or behave like me. All my relations. That means every person, just as it means every rock, mineral, blade of grass, and creature. We live because everything else does. If we were to choose collectively to live that teaching, the energy of our change of consciousness would heal each of us and heal the planet. Have any of you ever had writer's block? Or maybe it's not writing, but maybe it's drawing, if you're a drawer, or some sort of creative block. Maybe it's something related to a strategic plan at your work, or some sort of obstacle that you're trying to get over, some sort of block. Well, this week, I was having a little writer's block. And not because I was in a two-day anti-racism training, although that did shrink my week, but because I was feeling a block between my heart and what was to say this Sunday. This has been a really tough week for the world. And the block, I believe, whether it be in the sermon or whether it be in sharing joys and sorrows or whether it is the block of really feeling and taking in the pain of what is happening in Ukraine is really a block of the heart. It's not a block of the head, it's a block of the heart. As you know, a couple years ago, Hattie and I and Holly went to Ukraine and we visited our friends for 10 days over Thanksgiving. And boy, did we feel thankful for that opportunity. We hung out with our friends who showed us all over Kiev and Lviv and just other, other areas of just such cultural and um, ethnic uh, amazing am amazement, you know, architecture and museums and uh, shopping areas, a true vibrant part of the world. I got this Ukraine soccer stole or scarf as it is called and it has uh this little i forget the term hattie knows it um which is a very common embroidery in fabrics there and i came back and i think it was if i'm my memory is correct of sundays in march of 2020 i believe it was march 22nd maybe it was 29th i think it was 
one of those two, I talked about my trip and how how it related to our to what we're doing here in Columbus. And I didn't exactly go back and, and look at that sermon and say, well, let's just use that one. Uh, I got a writer's block. It was more just thinking about how much has changed in two years. And now with this uh, explosion of violence and death and loss and uncertainty of family and friends, and I am so thinking of Yvonne and all the videos and um, testimonies of people, just how much heartbreak there is in the world today and this morning here at UUCCI. And so I've been thinking about it in light of this sermon in which we're talking about spaces and places in our lives and what, what is the difference between a space and a place, which you might think, what a boring topic, kind of a, a little play on words sermon. But actually, I think there's a tremendous and beautiful distinction between the two. You see, for me, space is really just anything between three points. It's geometric, right? It's a space that either a border or something contains. It can be marked off. It can be, it can be uh, defined. It can be uh, surveyed. And it can be widely accepted. This is the space. And this space divides this space from this space, the edge of that space. And there are a lot of spaces in our lives, definitely, perhaps more that we've been uh, more deeply aware of in during the pandemic, the boundaries of space, of where we can travel between the edges of space and the pain it can sometimes feel when we are separated. But what makes a place Hmm. Well, for me, there is a transformation that can occur between a space and a place when a deeper thought and heart is laid in that space that defines its values, that defines its importance for you or for your family or for your congregation or for other areas in your life, a space becomes a place when it becomes less of a mark demarcation for what is beyond that space about the parameters, uh, be, or about, the, about what is beyond those lines of the perimeter. And it, and it focuses on what's inside and those who are inside that space that, that make it something of a sacred space, so to speak. And then I think about all of you in these sort of Jeopardy squares of, or not Jeopardy, sorry, wrong, wrong game, uh, Hollywood squares of, of face, of faces that I've seen for months, almost two years. And thinking about those, those areas in which you are this morning, then I think, are those spaces that you're in right now or are those places? places of your life, places that you have intentionally, consciously or unconsciously, you have been forced to be clear about the place upon which you have lived these past two years, a place you have perhaps spent more time than you'd like to admit, whether in work or in life or in lockdown or in quarantine, those places that we just see a glimpse of here on Sunday mornings, but are in many ways the place through which you are making meaning, through which you are um, trying to find joy, to process your sorrow, and to hopefully find an opportunity to open those doors and welcome in friends and family once more. Places in our lives are ones that we have 
power to transform with the love and compassion and values, the hospitality and the care that we hold at the center of our lives, you can create place by being intentional about what you hope takes place in that place. <laughs> but it requires some intentionality. It requires a bit of heart work. So the first thing I think placemaking requires is an understanding that we are separate, that we are separated, that something happened that created this space and that space, these, these borders in our lives. Something happened to us and perhaps something happened that we have intentionally or unintentionally supported which is drawing lines between spaces. So there starts with an awareness or an acknowledgement of separateness. And in that separateness, there is hopefully a sense of pain or loss and a sense of desire to be connected again. A desire to create, create a place upon which the world functions without borders, not without boundaries and, res and, and, and uh, respect and covenants of care between two people, but where those borders are less sharp. Maybe there's not barbed wire or pokey things on the gate, but there is a clear, a clear, a more clear invitation of how we transverse our spaces and how we arrive and wel are welcomed into the places that we hold dear. So I think about these places in our lives and I think about us returning to multi-platform next Sunday. Some of you will be eagerly anticipating going back into the sanctuary, into the building with masks. And some might be a little hesitant, but will still um, be excited to go, maybe apprehensive, but still looking forward to being face to face in our uh, in this place we call UUCCI. And some will remain here online, perhaps not yet ready to engage in that way, but who nevertheless, from their sacred place, from their place of love and at, at home or wherever you might be, are still wanting to be connected to this congregation. So I think about us coming back and coming back, and you might not uh, be fully aware of this, but there's going to be a big elephant in the room or in the property next door to us. And that's actually a very good, I didn't think of this joke, but a very good um, idiom because the Sri Ganesh Mandir, the Ganesh temple of our Hindu partners, Ganesh is the elephant god. It is the, 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 the remover of obstacles. And so the elephant in the room, boy, I'm, I'm just more proud of myself than I should be on that one. But nevertheless, over there in the, if you can't tell, I'm looking over there, um, in there on their property will be this beautiful 10,000 square foot facility that is in a very late stage of development. What last time I walked through, there's cabinetry in the kitchen. Some of the flooring has gone in. A lot of that exciting stuff right here around the corner. And so as we come back into our place, the space between our two congregations will be different. Something really different will have, will have happened um, by this by the rising of this temple. And it brings us to the question of how our spaces relate and how each can become a place where loving and learning and living together can be possible. So I've been thinking about another word, which is easement. What a technical term, 
for just a relationship around property line, lines, around spaces, to create an easement between two bodies, between two um, organizations. What does it mean to help bring easement to the world or to the spaces in our lives? What does it mean to offer ease, to facilitate, to make something facile or easy to traverse? Between those two spaces, yes, but also between two populations and of course, our Jewish community, the Jewish community who meets in our building as well, in their building. How do we create easement between these communities? Not just legally, like in an easement sent to the, I don't know, county, or uh, legally with articles of incorporation, but from a human to human, community to community process. How do we create easement of flow and relationship across a boundary, invisible as it is, still important? to mark. One of the most interesting and, and um, hard to wrap my mind around things when we went to Ukraine a couple years ago was how fluid the cultures were and the movement was between Russia and Ukraine. How fluid and moving it was, not dissimilar from the fluidness between El Paso and the towns just over the border in Mexico. There was a fluidity of movement, of employment, of um, shopping and other things present in the east of Ukraine that then had this interesting dilemma of some cultural connection across those spaces of Russia and Ukraine, and yet very some very clear distinctions. So there, there was a separateness that was created after the fall of the Soviet Union. There was a separateness created, and mind you, I was one years old, so I don't remember everything. There's a separateness when that happened, but the people who weren't in power, who weren't um, making all the decisions and drawing all the lines, were in that moment unclear where the boundaries of space was and where the places of their lives would then unfold for now 33 years. The relationship between those two peoples is very complex. I am not a Russian historian, but I am someone who cares deeply about the pain and the and the hope of this of this world. I think about what does it mean for us to be aware of the the proximity that we are with that conflict. The proximity, we are not geographically, but from a heart to heart perspective, how close this feels to us. For many people, not everyone, but for many people, how close this feels looking and watching the pain. Is it just like we're super empathic? We're just like super like caring people? Or is something else happening? that we feel a closeness to this idea of right and wrong, of the sanctity of place in the homes, in the streets, in the subways and spaces that have become sacred to a people, that have become places and homes like all of you are in right now, that are now like in an instant or in a couple days destroyed, that there's perhaps a connection and a separation that we are wanting to no longer 
acknowledge that we instead want to acknowledge but then move further beyond it and recognize a connection a solidarity this transnational solidarity that is emerging across across the world to say places are made sacred and that they should not be violated i think about one last thing this this reading or this this poem um of a snippet actually of a poem um that's often quoted um just as the single line and it's from rumi okay a beloved to many unitarian universalists and um i don't know liberal folks who like reading poetry it says, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Maybe this is another way to say it. Out beyond spaces of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a place. I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in that place, when the soul when the soul lies down in that place in the grass that world the world is just too full to talk about i hope that we can be a people of place making a people who long to move into that field into that place where the soul might lie down, that in that silence, we can say all that needs to be said. In our silence, all can be said. Here and abroad, may that be our work to do. May it be so, and amen.